the government's plan to deal with the seemingly endless stream of migrants, Becca, arriving in the UK on small boats, Becca, hit another roadblock today. Deporting asylum seekers to Rwanda has been declared unlawful by the Court of Appeal. But they don't necessarily have the last word. Back in December, the High Court decided that deporting asylum seekers to Rwanda for processing was legal. But then in April, a challenge was brought by lawyers from some individual asylum seekers, paid for by you and me probably, and the charity Asylum Aid. We heard the results of that challenge today, with the Court of Appeal deciding that a democratically elected government's controversial plans are in fact against the law. The government hit back quickly, rubbishing the ruling and declaring their intention to take things to the top, which is the Supreme Court, the final Court of Appeal in the United Kingdom. But this is tremendous, fearing that the Supreme Court may also refuse to greenlight the policy. Some Tories are tonight calling for the UK to quit the European Convention on Human Rights, the ECHR, as soon as possible. A set of international laws that we signed up to separately from the EU. That's the same ECHR that swept in to ground the first Rwanda flight just an hour and a half before it was due to take off last June. So quitting the convention would stop this happening again. The panel are geared, but joining me first to discuss this is immigration lawyer Harjap Singh Bagal, a good friend of the show. Harjap, um, help me out, mate. This is just becoming a, a, a joke. On what grounds, then, did the Court of Appeal deem today that this policy is unlawful? And do they have a right to do that, really? Well, it's a split decision. And what we have to understand is that laws are made by Parliament, treaties are signed by Parliament, and judges are there to make, sh make sure that Parliament comply with the laws and that everyone complies with the laws. So what the decision effectively says today was is that the judges were not 100% sure that if people are sent or asylum seekers are sent to Rwanda for processing, that the Rwandan government won't send them back to the country of origin um, where they would be tortured or subject to abuse or subject, you know, to, to being murdered or detention. So the, the Rwandan government and the British government together couldn't convince the judges that um, what they were doing was totally safe and that Rwanda is a safe country, despite in the last hearing having convinced the High Court to do so. So that's where we're at, technically. I mean, it says it all, doesn't it, about this country at the moment, this perfect storm of madness and confusion. Um, what would happen? We've talked about this before. Explain in layman's term the European Convention on Human Rights, the ECHR. Many people confuse this with we've left the EU, we should leave this, because why would we still be told what to do by a European court when we voted by 52%, Bex, before you start, to leave the European Union? What is the difference, Harjap, and what would happen if the British government, democratically elected, right, said, we're out of there, stuff it, we're gone? Well, the ECHR was essentially drafted by British lawyers and um, other lawyers from other countries to make sure that there wouldn't be another war again. And it gives many rights to many sort of citizens. It's not just about immigration. It's a, it, employment law, um, disability rights, sick pay, et cetera, et cetera. We could leave that, um, but then that would put us in a, in a category with Belarus and Russia who don't sign up to it, are the only European countries... So the that... only two countries <laughs> in the world that don't sign up to the ECHR are Belarus and Russia? In Europe, yeah. So everyone else does. And everyone else manages to deal with their asylum seekers. We have managed to deal with our asylum seekers in the past, in 2009 and 2010, sending 60,000 people back, despite being a signatory to the ECHR, despite being a part of the EU. So the problem is, and we discuss it time and time again, Jeremy, is that our removal rate of people has gone down and our processing times have gone up. It takes two years and we've got over 120,000 people waiting for a decision who should have been processed. And our removal rate has gone down from 60,000 in 2010 to less than 3,000 enforced removals Last you know, year, I was talking about it, Hodjap, Hodjap, I was talking about this last night, right? I don't understand, well, I do now, because I had it explained to me. I, don't, I didn't understand why politicians spend their entire time going on about these numbers are outrageous, we're going to stop the bro boats, we need to do something about unsafe routes, blah, 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 blah. Why doesn't somebody go, 
You know what? The processing system in this country is an utter disgrace. It takes too long. That is the problem. And I had it said to me last night by Benedict Spence, and I think it's right. He said, and I quote, because politicians are only interested in showing people what they think needs changing. They haven't got time, actually, in a five-year span by the time they lose their seat or whatever. And so it's all about rhetoric. But that doesn't help the very people in this country to understand why this is a continuing problem. You, I know, would understand this next question and not take it in the wrong way. Rishi Sunak says he fundamentally disagrees with the ruling. He says, and I quote, Rwanda is a safe country. The High Court agreed. We will now seek permission to appeal this decision to the Supreme Court. The policy of this government is very simple. It is this country and your government who should decide who comes here, not criminal gangs. You do understand, don't you, Harjup? That will resonate with millions of people in the UK watching this, not millions, obviously, right now, saying, and I quote, I actually agree with what he's saying. We need to be in charge of our own system. Well, look at what he's saying, not criminal gangs. So why not go after the gangs if the gangs are dictating? What he's doing and effectively saying is we can't go after the gangs, so we're going to try and deter um, the, the, the migrants. That's almost akin to saying that we can't stop drug dealers, so we're going to lock up all of the drug users and hope the drug dealers stop drug dealing. We know that's a plan destined to fail, and we know that locking up migrants or detaining them, even the threat of death on the, on the channel, does not deter them, so the deterrent policy doesn't work. Instead, let's go after the gangs and invest in elite units who can go and get these gangs and stop them. It's not as if we don't know where they are. The gangs have been operating from the same coast, Calais, and have been sending people to the same Kent coast for the last 20 years. It's almost like a single bus going the same route for 20 years with the same driver and same passengers. And when we ask the government, do you know what bus goes from A to B? Sorry, Gov, I haven't got a clue. Um, so these gangs are about 20, 20 steps ahead of the government. Why can't the government get these gangs? We can get bin Laden holed up in Pakistan and uh, in a stronghold. We can go and get Gaddafi holed up in his country in a st stronghold, put these people on trial, Saddam. We can't catch a gangs which are open, openly operating on a coast. Surely we would be better rather than spending £180,000 trying to send one person to Rwanda, saying to people in France, if you can dob in a gang and help us catch a gang, here's 10 grand for you, here's 20 grand for you. That would work much better, be more effective and spend that money wisely. And we forget one thing. There's only 500 places in Rwanda and out of them 500, we've got to take 100 or so Rwandans back under this treaty that we've signed. So that's a net of about 350, 400. That doesn't even cover a, cover a day's crossings. What are we going to do with the rest of the six, 364 days worth of crossings? Hi, Jeff. You so know what? We've spoken a lot and I absolutely appreciate And learning, doing this job, I learned a lot. And, and that, what you said today with passion, I really appreciate it. Hi, Singh, thank you so much indeed, Bagal. Um, ladies, what a panel tonight. It's like Jez's Angels are in. Head of news at the News Movement, Rebecca Hudson. Good evening, I can't wait. Former Labour advisor, Frankie Leach. Have you been to some sort of, what have you been to? Some do? I have a conference. Oh. <laughs> Vegetarian comes and former Brexit party MEP, please God, she's here. Alex Phillips, um, Alex, I want to start with you. Yeah. Hardship Singh Bagel, speaking quite a bit of sense there. We go on every single night about people will only look at that top line. There's millions of people, it seems, that you know are angry with immigration. Mm. The processing system doesn't work. We're talking about Rwanda, right? He's saying at best it'll be 400 people. It doesn't even touch the sides of the issue. What, what's your response to what he said? Right, so three things. First of all, he's absolutely right. As soon as they announce this Rwanda plan, I realise they're making a straw man so they can turn around and go, it's not our fault, it's not the Home Office, it's not our failings, it's lefty lawyers, it's this, it's that, it's the other. It's everyone else but not us. These flights were never going to take off. And this processing fee per person doesn't even take into account the millions being spent by the taxpayer on all of these pantomime court cases either. So it's never going to work. The second thing that he said, and actually on that point, um, it's very convenient for the government as well, holding up this straw man going, oh, look at the boats crossing the channel when legal migration is over 600,000. You know, people aren't talking about the 600,000, they're talking about the 80,000. Um, but the other thing that's worth pointing out, and he said just then in that interview, you know, we managed to find bin Laden in Pakistan. Why can't we stop the gangs? I'll tell you why. Bin Laden hid in Pakistan as long as it suited the Pakistani government to hide him, that when the Pakistan Pakistani government decided, actually, we're going to give him up now. They told America and he was gone. So why is it that the French, despite the money being given to them, can't 500 million. control three miles of coastline? There is 
collusion. There's collusion. The gangs, which are largely Kurdish gangs, run around with impunity in Brussels, in France. The, 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 they know. The authorities in these countries know who they are. My friend is a, an investigative journalist, and he's been following these gangs for ages. There is collusion. It actually suits a lot of European countries for the last stop to be Britain. Their, their asylum applications fail in the EU. They come all the way along to the, 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 the coastline of Calais. Last stop, Britain. Great. The rest of the EU can wash their hands. Very interesting, Frankie, what she says. Yes, but I think there's two things to point out here. The first is that the best way to get rid of criminal gangs is to open up some safe routes, and therefore they're not able to sell the only route available, which is crossing the channel. But dob them in, in get them boat. arrested. The second thing I'd like to say, and nobody seems to have mentioned this yet, is the issue with Rwanda, which is that Rwanda is not a safe country. How do you know it that? Is a, Rishi Sunak says it is. Let me, Who I'll do I tell believe? You, I'll tell you. It have is you been to Rwanda? No, but I do a lot of work analysing the human rights cases of Rwanda, and let me tell you, killing their political dissidents, killing the opposition voices, sweeping away homeless people from the streets. Massive issues around human rights. Paul Gagami, uh, really a dictator at this point. He's not leaving. There's no democratic elections there planned that people feel like they can actually vote in. So we're not just talking about the immigration plan here. We're not just talking about why the Rwanda plan is failing. We're talking about is Rwanda a multilateral partner that the UK should be dealing with when it comes to this stuff? And I'm sure they will have discussed that in the court case today. Explain to me then, Bex, how, how Rishi Sunak would then say it is a safe country if Frankie Leach says it patent in terms of human rights isn't. What's the truth? Because they've got nowhere to go. I mean, it isn't a safe country. As you said, you know, opposition, opposition uh, politicians in that country say it is not safe to process and house asylum seekers here. They, they recently murdered Congolese asylum seekers for the audacity of protesting against the conditions they were being kept in. It is not a safe country for us There's to no process. There's no free press people. either. Exactly. So, of course, we shouldn't be sending people there. And I think to Alex's point and to Harjab's, if we could just sort out the processing problem, that would remedy a huge amount of... But this is what I don't get, and I saw you nodding. When we talked with Benedict, about this last night, right? Politics is, is supposed to be, in my mind, about identifying problems and putting forward solutions. I get told increasingly by my panels every night that, that actually for politicians, and this is an eye-opener at 57, 58 next Friday, is, is actually they want to be able to shout about immigration, they want to be able to shout about yeah, inflation, but they don't actually want to cure it because that, that's appalling. <laughs> Why do we not get a... I said this last night. You, what about a cross-party approach to sorting out a bloody processing system that patently doesn't work? Why is that not the answer? Well, listen, the Home Office has been the bogey department for decades now. But why it haven't we sorted it then? On every plant. It's a very good question. Why haven't we? I mean, first of all, I think... Benedict is right, actually. There's a sort of lackadaisical approach by politicians. And then what politicians keep using are reshuffles. And we've had, actually, three different prime ministers in the space of a year. No department knows who's running it at any given moment. And then it changes again. But I also think there's a, a, a bit of sort of willful pushback from the civil servants, very often in Whitehall, against well, the government. Well, of course, Frankie, well. you're shaking your head. The civil servants' union are taking a democratically elected um, government's policy to, to court. They're paid to carry out right. what the British people voted for. Yeah, but this is a trade union. It's within its rights to criticise policy. But the only thing I would say in terms of the you know, the issue with the backlog, I think it suits the government to have a crisis with the backlog because then it's very easy to turn around to your constituents when you're concerned that you might not win the next election and say, here's an issue that we're different from Labour on. This is a migration crisis. Well, we're let me tell you what I think. I don't down. think the British public will swallow any no. political party now. I think they need action. I think. Listen but to this, right? the British public, as I said, big, like, you know, one big blob on this. There is a difference of opinion. People feel differently about migration. They might do, and but don't, don't, don't try and convince me in a policy. million years... Where the, the majority of people in this country see this as a massive problem and think it needs dealing with. And yes, they might read the headlines and they might go, illegal migrants. Nobody would disagree, surely, right, that this processing system is defunct and needs changing yeah, and it needs planning and it needs strategic thought over years. Yeah, absolutely. Not... I mean, look, I was with asylum seekers last night who have been here for about a year and a half, people from Eritrea, which is a country that has an extremely high acceptance rate because it is a dictatorship. We call it the North Korea Where are they? In a Africa. hotel somewhere? They are waiting in a hotel. They want to work. They're not allowed mm. to work. They feel like a burden to society. All they want to do is go out there and support the country that has shown them essentially sanctuary, but it's the government dragging its heels. They 
were given the letters and said, fill in this form and we will speed up your processing because we're trying to get rid of the... Can backlog. I read They've this? They've still not heard back. Should the UK leave the European Convention on Human Rights so we don't have to play to their rules? Yes, 83%, no, 17 John, yes, we need to get out and get the job done ourselves. Stephen, I thought the government ran the country on behalf of the public, not unelected judges. Michael, the ECHR is 75 years out of date. Jim, trouble is there's no one in bloody government who has the balls to do it and I'm afraid nothing will change. People talk the talk but will not walk the walk and anon the ECHR affords fantastic protection to free citizens of signatory countries. The legislation isn't necessarily the issue. It's the altruistic interpretation of that legislation that is the issue. ECHR, quickly, you are a well, Brexit... Yeah. What, what do you make of that? Look, Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary, I think back in 2014, was banging on we were going to leave the ECHR when the UK was um, in, 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 in charge of the EU on the rotating presidency. Apparently, we are going to leave the ECHR and create a British Bill of Rights, and that was 10 years ago. Hasn't happened. Harjup says the only two countries in Europe, which I thought was quite interesting, yeah, you know, that, don't, that, that have left this are Belarus and Russia, for a, Christ's sake. It's a good sake. point that, that one of your respondents said on Twitter, which is a lot of the legislation is 70 years out of date when it comes to looking at the, the mass migratory flows we have now. It's not necessarily fit for purpose. But one thing I would say, given that a lot of the um, laws in the ECHR were written by British judges, the idea that if we left it, we're suddenly going to send kids up chimneys and start shooting people in the face is mad. You know, this is a country that has always upheld very high standards of human rights far more so than most of our continental neighbours. Yeah, you not think so quickly? No, we're decreasing things like the right to protest. You can shut down a protest now under human rights laws because it's too noisy. Go and live in no, Eritrea, we're, then. We're seeing a massive attack on human rights. Well, it's getting if that it's way. it's so bad, moment. why does every bugger want to come here, because then? Because the things that they are fleeing from are unimaginably worse. Yeah, but that's... What, in Albania? Yes, yeah, of course. exactly. In, in rural Punjab. Do me a favour. Maybe Eritrea, not there. I didn't know what you said. Or Albania. What you're understanding is the <laughs> yeah. plurality of people who seek asylum. Anyway...